Well, now it's another Friday and I really miss our clinical meeting. So I must keep in touch with all you boys and girls, being more or less confined to home. Uh, miss all of y'all, the residents, the registrars and all the consultants, nurses, etc. who used to attend this Friday meeting. Before I start, I need to make one correction on the snippet that I gave you last Friday. A mistake which I must correct. If you remember, I told you that Spain was neutral in the First World War. That is correct. The mistake that I made was that I said Germany bombed Spain before the First World War. That is a mistake. Actually, Germany bombed Spain just before the Second World War. I fully well know that the Spanish Civil War was between 36, 1936 and 1938, between the Nationalist forces and the Republican forces, and the Nationalist forces being headed by General Francisco Franco. Hitler was on Franco's side and therefore ordered Nazi Germany to bomb the Republican area of Spain, destroying in that time a small little place called Guernica, which, uh, uh, which made Pablo Picasso paint his famous canvas, Guernica. Spain, incidentally, was also neutral in the Second World War, neutral both in the First World War and the Second. Let me now proceed with the second snippet. We still are in the midst of a raging pandemic. And I thought I should speak to you of one other great pandemic that hit Europe somewhere in the Middle Ages, not exactly the Middle Ages, but between roughly 1347 to 1351. It was called the Black Death the plague. It was a remarkable pandemic. And I shall tell you how it started and how it progressed. As almost all pandemics in the world, it was believed to have started, it was believed to have started in China, spreading across Central Asia and the belly of Asia, right up to the Black Sea. Now, at that point in time, there were some Italian traders along the shore of the Black Sea trading with the Byzantine Empire and also with Central Asia. They were attacked by the Tartars. You know, the Tartars were wild, very strong, armed horsemen from the steppes of Russia and the Italian traders therefore took refuge in a small enclave, a Genoese enclave in Crimea. That enclave was called Kaffa in those days. I'm not quite sure what the name was subsequently. If I may mistake not, it was something like Pedosia, but I'm not quite sure about it. So the Tartars laid siege to that enclave, and the siege lasted for three years. But the siege, they couldn't lift, they couldn't conquer Kafka. Unfortunately for everyone, the Tartars besieging Kafka were infested with plague. So they did a remarkable thing. They took the bodies of all their plague victims and catapulted them into Kappa, where the Genoese were. So plague broke out in the Genoese population of Kappa, and many died. The Genoese decided, therefore, to leave Kappa and sail back to Italy. In six galleys, they sailed back. Many of them were plague-stricken. The galleys also had infected rats, which carried plague. 
and they landed in Genoa and Genoa was in the grip of a terrible plague which destroyed more than three quarters of the population of Genoa. The social and moral fabric of Genoa was totally broken. People thought that they were going to die the next day. So how did they react? Most of them thought that death was coming soon, so why not make merry? And they indeed did so. Death did come to them. From Genoa, this epidemic or pandemic spread to other parts of the, other cities in Italy. It was Florence which was affected, Venice was affected, and the greater part of Italy. From Italy, the plague went to France, to Belgium. It then went to the northern countries, right up to Scandinavia, and spread all over Europe. It is believed that this pandemic killed a quarter of the population of Europe, which would amount to about 25 million people, a little less than the pandemic of influenza of 1918 and 1919. They didn't know what the plague was due to. Some thought it was a visitation from God. Some thought it was a confluence of Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter. Some blamed it on the Jews so that they were persecuted and many Jews were killed because of that. The symptoms of this disease were beautifully described by a surgeon of that time, a person called Guy de Choyac, who was in France and who stayed through the plague in his same city. And he said there were two forms. In one form, the patient had cough, spat out blood, and if you came close to him, you were infected. And he died within a matter of two or three days. That really corresponds to pneumonic plague, where the infection affects the lungs. And there was the other one, where he said patients with plague had large boils or swellings in the armpits and the groin and later in other parts of the body, ran high fever and died usually within five days. There was never any recovery. It totally destroyed, as I said, the moral and the social fabric of the whole of Europe. People reacted to it differently. There were some, for example, the Franciscan order, who decided to flagellate themselves. They flogged themselves from city to city, starting from Italy and traveling through Europe, flogging themselves in the hope that by this action, God would take mercy, mercy and stop the plague. However, Ultimately, whilst they travelled through Europe, they pillaged and plundered, and the Pope ultimately declared that if they did not stop, he would excommunicate them. So the plague then was stopped. How did the cities of Europe react to this plague? To start with, they were paralysed. But then they did what is being to some extent, what they did to some extent what is being done right now. For example, Venice closed its doors to outsiders and did not let any citizen of Venice leave it. The same followed, same was followed by Marseille in France and other cities in Italy. Quarantined people. The little island or the little town of Dubrovnik, which in now what is Croatia, quarantined all its people refusing to allow a single individual to travel outside. They were also cruel, for example. If there was a plague-ridden house, they would bar it so that no one could come out, even those who had not had plague, and they were left to die. So this is how they managed their plague. Burials were remarkable. They were properly sanitized, given certain places, 
so that the infection would not spread. And how did the doctors fare? Remarkably, the doctors attended to the plague victims. They were dressed in outlandish costumes. The headgear had a large beak as if to protect the doctor. And in the beak, there were aromatic herbs with powerful smells in the hope that the plague would not reach them. But many doctors indeed died. They never touched their patient. They just they touched their patient with a wand saying that this would cure them. And this is how the plague was handled in those days. As I said, a quarter of the population of the whole of Europe amounting to about 25 million people perished in this plague. <clears throat> Some thought of biblical terms, in biblical terms, as the apocalypse, the four horsemen, conquest, war, famine, and death, which strode or rode across this planet, bringing death and destruction to all. But this is the story of the pandemic called the Black Death. I'm not quite sure why it is called black. According to some, it is because it was passed on by black rats. Most of you doctors, of course, know that the plague is caused by an organism called the Yersinia pestis. Yersinia, because it was Yersin, a man working in Cox laboratory, who first described the organism in association with Tikasato, a Japanese who had also worked with Robert Koch in Germany. So that's the way, that's the way, well, that's the reason why, you know, it is called Yersinia pestis. And interestingly, I'm sure you know, that plague is a zoonotic, which means basically it infects rats and other rodents. And the flea, which is there within the skin, of the infected rat sucks his blood and therefore has the bacillus within it. When the rat dies, the flea jumps onto a human being nearby and infects the human being. So not, not uncommonly, an epidemic of plague is preceded by a large epidemic in which the rats die. So in those days, when they found in a particular place where there were a number of rats that were dying, they often felt that, oh my God, we are going to have the plague coming in. I think, I said this happened in the Dark Ages. I'd just like to explain to you what the Dark Ages were. Not exactly in the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages commence after the fall of Rome. Rome was sacked by Alaric the Goth in 412 and it received the coup de grace by some northern tribesmen or northern barbarians or by some northern king whose name I can't recollect who finally gave Rome the coup de grace and Rome fell I think in 471 or 475. Now, the Dark Ages are supposed to extend from 470 to 1000 AD. And between 1000 AD and 1400, and that's where, 1400, and that, that's where really the Renaissance first began, the world or the way of Europe began to see a ray of light. But many consider the Dark Ages perhaps continue till the start of the Renaissance. But actually by 1000 AD, there was a ray of sunshine in the Dark Ages. In fact, I wonder if you know that the first university in Europe came about in 1000 AD. It was in Salerno, a famous place, because it was in Salerno that the Allies had their landing in Italy when they invaded Italy during the Second World War. And amazingly, in that university, they taught medicine in rhyme, in poetry. Unimaginable, but that is indeed true. So this is what, where the Dark Ages were. I just want to tell you that there was another ghastly plague 
in the 6th century AD, during the time of Emperor Justinian, sometime between 545 and 550, or 550 and 55. It was also a great epidemic which destroyed a good part of Rome. But most important of all, Rome was partly responsible for the fall of a great civilization. Because in the time of Pericles, where Greece had reached its very zenith, Pericles was one who was elected to rule Athens. And Athens was at its height during the rule of Pericles. Plague struck the city and destroyed a good bit of the population of the city. It was a downfall, it was the beginning of the downfall of Pericles and the beginning of the downfall of Athens, which was the most important city-state of Greece. Now, amazingly, this plague has been described by the historian Thucydides. You know, there were two great historians of the past. The first was Herodotus, and the next was Thucydides. And amazingly, the description of this plague was as follows. The description is that these patients who had this plague quickly died. And they died of an unremarkable disease which has never subsequently been rec recorded in the annals of medicine. They suffered a gangrene of the fingers, a gangrene of the eyeballs, and the genitalia, and they die. Now it's amazing why this description has never been given later on. Is it possible that some of the diseases in the past have changed their profile and have not occurred again? Indeed, that is really a possibility. And also one final word. You know, plague at that time was a generic word. Any disease which killed people quickly was dubbed the plague, thus diphtheria, smallpox, which really ravaged all of Europe, just as it that ravaged the greater part of the world in those days. Typhoid, scarlet fever, and bubonic plague were all termed plague. Anything, any illness which quickly brought about death was termed plague, and in that was also included bubonic plague. So now, I think sacred spirit, the snippet is about to end. I remember also our humanities class, which used to be held once a month. And I'm not going to end on this dire note. If you remember, I often said a poem. I'm going to set aside a poem to add in a more happy note. I'm not going to give you a reference to the context. You might not catch the exact drift of what I say. But it's a poem, it's a light poem, and I'm going to say it. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that glides along the street and rubs its back upon the window pane. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days that lift and drop a question on your plate. There will be time for you and me, and time for all the indecisions and the decisions, and yet time for all the visions and the revisions before the taking of toast and tea. In the room, women come and go, talking of Michael Angelo. Thank you, my friends. Hopefully, see you next Friday.